Well, it's a great pleasure to be able to share uh, this morning. As uh, Pastor Dave said, we're wrapping up the last uh, section in our series on We Are Family. And so uh, the last couple of weeks we've been here. And this morning I want to just really share a little bit about uh, our story over the last year and, uh, and my family. And so I know that there's, there's lots here that uh, are, are welcoming new lives into their home and experiencing this new joy and this excitement that comes uh, from uh, welcoming a new life. But uh, I want to talk about uh, ours this morning. If you haven't met her yet, her name is Adeline, and she's over here. And my wife tells me that uh, she's going to blow up about halfway through service because she's going to be needing to be fed. So if they run out, that's not because the message is terrible, I hope. All right. Just as a, as a church, I just want to say thank you for for how you have embraced us and how you've walked with us through the journey of uh, many years of waiting and complications and, and all of that uh, as you celebrated with us uh, with the arrival and just given us space uh, to, to grow into uh, this new se- season of parenthood. Uh, it's really been uh, a great and we appreciate that and we say thank you for that. But uh, as Pastor Dave said, nothing brings new joy and excitement and unity to a family than a new life. This is really fresh in my mind, obviously, and so uh, this morning I want to challenge us uh, with this picture of a new life and new believers, new, new members in our family, and I want to draw some parallels between uh, our family and the church uh, family of God. So hopefully you'll be able to track uh, that with us. As we're learning what it is to be parents and welcome a new life into our home, uh, and how do we, I want to look at how, how do we reproduce uh, new life uh, in our family, in, in our family as a church and into this household of faith. Uh, this picture of a family is woven uh, right through the New Testament, and so it's a great example. Uh, Jesus spoke of it, the Apostle Paul wrote of it, and so I think it's a great picture uh, to help us understand about who we are to be as a family. Uh, Pastor Andy spoke last week about adoption, and so in contrast to that, uh, last week, uh, adoption is, is growth through transfer into our family, whereas this week we're talking about reproducing, and that's growth through uh, intentionally going after people, uh, intentionally working towards uh, bringing new people into our church family. So that's what we're looking at this morning. How do we respond when new people are born into our family? new believers. And so uh, we're going to land in this passage that Pastor Dave wrote uh, for, uh, for, uh, read for us in First Thessalonians. If you want to take your Bible and turn there, uh, that's where we're going to uh, land eventually here. When we think of what Pastor Andy spoke of last week, adoption, uh, this is absolutely something that we need to be good at. We need to be open arms, uh, looking for people that are coming in and, uh, and embracing and adopting uh, those who are followers of Christ that the Lord sends our way for any number of reasons. Uh, this area is absolutely full of people who used to go to church. And I often will say to people, I wonder what it would look like for us to be the church for people who used to go to church. Because uh, there, this area was full of large churches and they're not uh, there anymore. So that's, that's certainly a, 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 something that we need to be good at uh, doing, embracing people as they come, as the Lord sends them. But there's a way that we will grow that is closer to God's heart. It's way more important, and that is through reproduction. We need to be open hands with the gospel, and we need to be reaching people for Christ, reproducing this new life that we experience in Christ in other people. So let's just stop there, and that's where we're going today, and I want to pray, and then we'll, uh, we'll jump in a little bit more. God, thank you for, uh, for your word. God, thank you for your heart. God, we know that your heart is for the lost, and God, our, uh, our, our communities, our neighborhoods, our schools, our workplaces, uh, God, they are all full of people that need to hear uh, this message of the good news of the gospel of Jesus, and and so, God, we know that that is your heart for all to come, to know who you are. And so, God, would we be challenged this morning to engage in that heart as well as your people, as your followers. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. For quite a while in church history, this job of, of reaching out, of, of, uh, of, of teaching, of, of sharing the gospel uh, 
really was seen as the role of uh, a, pro a paid professional, a professional pastor or minister. And I think this is a real shame. This is the Great Commission. This is what Jesus uh, spoke of. Uh, and so this is all of our job all the time. And Pastor Dave was showing me uh, a book in his office that he has. I haven't read it, but uh, the, the title uh, of this had the Great Commission. It had great uh, stroked out, and it was called the Everyday Commission, because that's really a, maybe a better title for it. This is an everyday commission uh, of who we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to live out all the time. As followers of Jesus, we are to be reproducers all the time. Now, you don't have to be all of this process, but you have to be part of the process. Dallas Willard was an American philosopher, and he wrote uh, a lot about the Christian spiritual formation uh, he writes about the Great Commission, but he titled his book, The Great Omission, writing that the church has switched from making disciples to making Christians. Like, when we get people to the point of decision, that's the end of the, the, end of the role, and really, that's not where the job finishes. That's really where the hard, star, hard stuff begins. Can you imagine if we had Adeline, and we just, once she was here, we just decided, okay, she's here, great, we have a kid, Let's just leave her on her own. She'll, she'll figure it out herself. Uh, that's not really a part of Responsible Parenting 101. And so uh, the real work begins when they return home, when we begin to feed, we begin to, to train them, to grow them, uh, to instruct them. We're, we're, we're trying to reproduce in her now the ideas and the characteristics and the, the qualities that we want to see in a godly woman. So what happens when uh, we fail to reproduce? There is, uh, uh, I just will say, churches that don't reproduce don't have a future. And there was a, there's an article uh, from CBC on March 10th that was called From Sacred to Secular. And in this article, they predict that in the next 10 years, 20, out of the 27,000 churches in Canada, about 9,000 of those churches will close. That's just in the next 10-year period. And so um, this is a really important thing that we have, this idea of reproducing or reproduction uh, in our minds as we, as we look to uh, grow the gospel in our communities. If you've read the, uh, the little booklet that we hand out for our membership, the beginning of our membership, I Am a Church Member, uh, the same author of that book writes another book, a little book called The Autopsy of a Deceased Church. And in his list of uh, 10 reasons why churches die, uh, number five on the list is because the great or the everyday commission becomes the everyday omission. And so there are fears uh, of reproducing for both our church and for the, new, for the new people that we are trying to reach. Uh, for the new believer, you know, stepping into a new family can be scary. Uh, it's strange. It's hard to understand. They do things differently. They do things that we don't understand. Uh, maybe there's a lack of understanding or support from from those that are, have been a long-term uh, in their family. And so uh, there's lots of things that maybe rise up uh, when somebody's coming to, uh, to investigate the faith and what it means to be a part of a church family. For our church family, uh, there's fears of change. This is something that uh, we often uh, try to push back against. Every time there's, there's change uh, with every new person that's added to our church, it really means that our family is going to change. And so we push back against that naturally. And it also means work for us. It means work for the followers of Jesus who are mature in the faith, who are going to come alongside those who are new to mentor, to teach, to train, to instruct, to model a life that honors God. It doesn't just happen all by itself. And so it does take work. But this is all uh, a process that we can all connect with. Uh, if you think about your own life and you think about uh, the things that you've stepped into, uh, whatever that is, it's likely because somebody has worked to reproduce that inside of you. And so we are all beneficiaries of uh, this reproducing. And so uh, it's something that we should be able to connect with. We, we think back to how people poured into us and how people reproduced uh, in us. And we are thankful for that. And uh, we need to be that uh, for people as well. And so I'm going to just walk through some of the steps of, of reproducing and some of uh, the, uh, the ways that those parallel uh, the body of Christ in the church as well. And so just hopefully that you can track with me along with this, what this has, has, has been for our family, how it's changed us, 
and, uh, and what we're learning through it. So first of all, we, we, we had a decision to grow our family. Now, Jenna and I had these discussions way before, I think before I even asked her to, to go out the first time. We were already having discussions about, about things like that. We wanted to know that we were both on the same trajectory of what we wanted in life. And so uh, that was a goal. That was something that we'd been praying for and, and believing for and waiting for right from the, right from the get-go. Uh, I think the church uh, parallels uh, this, uh, this decision that needs to be part of what we, what we understand is necessary uh, to our growth. We need to con- consciously make this decision that we are going to be uh, reproducing, that we are going to need to expand the family through reproducing ourselves. It's something that we have to work towards. We have to be active in praying for it and, and reaching out. And, uh, and, and so uh, this is a decision that we have to make. Jesus in Matthew 13 uh, talks about sowing seed. And he talks about how uh, you, we sow seed and it falls on uh, different, different types of ground. Not all ground is, is ready to receive uh, the seed that's thrown out. So we need to sow uh, sparingly, we need to, or not sparingly, uh, generously, and so uh, that, we can, that we can reap uh, generously as well. And so if you watch the farmers in the spring, you won't see them walking along the field Uh, looking for a good patch of soil and and sticking a couple of seeds in it, you'll see them sowing a lot of seed to produce a crop. And so we we work towards uh, building a family, sowing seed. We wait and we pray and we trust that God is working in hearts and we await a harvest. Sometimes it takes so long to see the seed take root that we, we get to a place where we're we're maybe settling into a, a spot of disappointment and, 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 try, and, and retreating from our prayers. We, we start to ask questions. Is, is this really God's heart for, uh, for us to see new life? Uh, if this is God's heart, why aren't we seeing anything? But then the day comes, and there's signs of new life. Out of the blue, something has changed. There appears to be signs of a new life beginning to grow, and all the effort and sacrifice seems worth it. Maybe you have that in your mind that you've, you've been working or you've been praying for somebody, you've been, you've been working at sowing seed in their life for a long time, and, and maybe it feels like uh, you, you aren't getting anywhere, and you, you ask God questions like, Does, do you care about this person? Why, why, are, why, are you not, uh, why am I not seeing you work? But then you see that sign of life, and they start to show interest. And so we fan the spark of interest. We wait for the moment that they will choose to give their heart to Jesus. It's a time of waiting and expectation. This is an important place to be. If we aren't actively expecting people to make commitments to Christ and working and praying and believing God for this, I don't think that we will continue to see it. Have you ever been to a church where you've walked in and you're the guest and and you, you, you go in the back door and you, you get in there and you just feel like all the eyes are on you. And you just get this feeling like they probably haven't seen anybody new for a while. It's probably because they haven't. And uh, as a church, we need to be expecting that there's always going to be new people among us. Uh, we, won't, we shouldn't be shocked that God is sending people our way if we have this expectation. If we're sowing properly and we're prepared and expecting we shouldn't be shocked to see that God is adding people to our church and we'll be ready to accept them in. I remember the day that Jenna told me that she was pregnant. I actually still have the, wall, the paper in my wallet. And uh, what, a, what a rush, what a joyous day. Uh, for the first little while afterwards, I thought that uh, after, after the first complications, I thought that it would take a long, uh, just a short time to get pregnant again. But it was, uh, it, was, it was a little while. And you start to kind of retreat back into... Uh, wondering if it's actually going to happen. So when she told me, I certainly was shocked. Then the, mo- then the months of expectation and preparation come. Lots of items to prepare. And then it happens. The new one arrives. What a joy. I remember looking at her for the first time and just being overwhelmed with emotion uh, as Jenna held her. God's grace to us all wrapped up in a little baby girl. Let the celebrations begin. Flowers and gifts and cards and and phone calls and congratulations. Man, did we ever feel loved. For our church, this is the moment when someone makes a commitment to follow Jesus for the first time and a new member of our family is born. 
This is also something to be celebrated. This is something that we should make a big deal about. In Luke chapter 15, verse 7, uh, Jesus says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So how do we look to heaven as an example in this? How do we, how do we begin to celebrate the one over the 99 versus maybe what I feel like the church does better at is celebrating the 99 over the one? This verse says that heaven rejoices, and yet the church is often silent. Again, this past Monday night at our kids' club program, uh, there was a young person that gave their heart to the Lord. Isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that something that we should be celebrating? Now, I mean, you probably didn't know that, so I'm not trying to make you feel guilty for not celebrating, but this morning, somebody gave their heart to Christ last Monday night in this building under the ministry of Sobel. Isn't that great? Does that make your heart happy? And so the arrival of a new child of God into the kingdom is the whole reason why we do what we do. It is something to celebrate. So now we have a baby. Now what? How do we, how do we care for this, uh, this child? Do we just leave them on their own? No. And it's the same way with, with new believers. We don't leave them on their own to fend for themselves. This is where the journey of discipleship begins. It's our responsibility to see them through to maturity. And so I want to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 again, that passage that Pastor Dave read, and just really look for the two pictures in this passage that uh, talk about what we are to do as the family of God, welcoming uh, new people into the family. And so beginning at uh, verse 7, it said again, we, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother, taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. And then in verse 11, for you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So I want us to ask, what expectation do we have of new believers? And if you, if you parallel this with the expectation that we have for, for our own kids, you know, sometimes I think the expectations that we have uh, are somewhat unreasonable. Do we expect them to know how to behave? Do we expect them to uh, clean up after themselves, uh, know how to speak the lingo or, or, or do the, the normal things? If that was what we expected of Adeline when she returned home, Uh, we would have been quite disappointed. She really didn't know how to do anything. The truth is, for the first month, uh, Adeline didn't do a whole lot. She flailed her arms, and Jenna said, I don't think she even knows those exist yet. Uh, She stared blankly into space. She ate what we gave her. Uh, We had lots of first experiences together. We, We had the first uh, the first bath, we had the first sleepless night, uh, we had the first explosion, which resulted in the first bath, actually. Uh, but really, she seemed somewhat unaware of, of anything around her, and, and that, was, that was how the first month kind of went. She spent the majority of her time resting and, and just getting to, to know herself and, and, and who, she, who she is, I guess. I don't know what's going on up there, really. Uh, <laughs> But there is a way that things have to happen properly. And, uh, you know, if we miss a feeding or we, we do things wrong, she is very quick to let us know about it. She really, she has opened up new understanding and experiences and energy that we never expected. So really, our, our expectation for new believers coming in the family shouldn't be uh, much more uh, different than that. It's all new experiences, new surroundings, new feelings and emotions, If we are open ourselves, new members in our family will open up new understanding and experiences and energy that we haven't felt in a while. So let's look at the two pictures here in this uh, passage. In verse 7, we forget this first picture of a mother. And talk about mothers. Mothers just have this amazing natural ability to uh, make sure that kids are cared for and looked after and clean and, and just... You know, holding their head up, caring for them, all of these things. Uh, I, I wasn't teaching Jenna these things. She was, 
she was absolutely teaching me these things. And, and, and as I watch her uh, care for our child, it's just this motherly uh, instinct, this motherly nature that's in her. It's putting aside your own desires, your own wants, to make sure that the child is cared for. Making sure the environment is safe and they are protected. So how do we do this in our church family? If we parallel that, how do we, how do, we do those same things? How do we make sure that our church is a safe environment for people that are coming in? to learn and to grow and to experience and, and, and explore. Do we help them hold their heads up? Do we give them space to rest and find their bearings? Do we put aside our own needs and desires, and are we willing to do whatever it takes to help them grow? What else do mothers do? It goes on in this verse 8. It says, it says being affectionately desirous, desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel. They share the gospel. They feed Mothers feed their kids. Kids don't know how to do this for themselves. If we left a child, uh, if we left Adeline to herself, then she would starve. And if she starved, that would be on us. That wouldn't be her fault. Someone fed you when you weren't able to do it for yourself. That is normal. So why do we have different expectations in our church family when it comes to new believers? We, how, why do we expect them to be able to feed themselves uh, as well. If new believers don't receive the nourishment they need, their growth will be stunted, and that's on us. Adeline ne- needs good food to grow. We can't just feed her garbage and expect that she's going to be healthy. Uh, the same for new believers. They need good food for proper growth. The verse goes on in, in verse 8 there, and not only the gospel did they, sh- did they, sh- they share of God, but also their very lives because you had become very dear to us. And this just speaks of family, I think, does it not? This is family, we are a family. We don't just feed Adeline and leave her to do her own thing and, and to, and to just, just do whatever she wants. Uh, we share our lives with her, we take her wherever we go. We, we, we have these experiences and we have them together with her. So this is on us, this is about more than just sharing the gospel, this is about sharing our lives with each other in the church. It's about having loving relationships with each other so that everyone becomes mature in Christ. How effective as parents would, it, would we be if we shared all of the head knowledge with Adeline, but we didn't let her experience our lives with us? And it's the same thing goes in the church as well. We can teach the head knowledge of who God is and but, but really getting uh, into each other's lives and experiencing Jesus in everyday life is where it really begins to take root and take hold of our hearts. So are we coming alongside new believers more than just sharing the head knowledge of God? Or will we allow them to share in the journey of what it is to follow Jesus? The second picture that we see in this passage is the picture of a father. And so we look at uh, verse 11. It says, For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. What are the things in this passage that we're supposed to do? It says we're supposed to encourage and comfort and, and urge people towards the calling of God in their lives. As a newborn, I, I know that whatever Adeline does, she doesn't know any better. My job is to comfort her and to encourage her. And I'm enjoying what she is and what she does, but I'm looking forward to what she will be. So part of urging her to this life, uh, uh, this, this living a life worthy of the calling of God is what we do in, in child dedication. Uh, we, we, we're setting the pace for a life uh, that is honoring to God. As she grows and learns to communicate, these are the things that we need to continue to do for her. So how do we do this for new believers in our church family? How do we go out of our way to encourage them and to uh, comfort them and to urge them towards a life that is worthy of God's calling. Uh, Pastor Kerry Newhoff, uh, who pastors a church over in uh, Barrie called Connexus Church, uh, wrote an article about uh, churches that don't want to grow. They're, they're, not, they're not worried about uh, reproducing. They're not, they're not focused on that. They don't want to grow. And he basically says, uh, whether we do these things 
for the people that God sends us. Uh, if, whether we do them or not, we're going to lose people. So if we work hard to properly care for new believers and we feed them and we share our lives together and we encourage them and we comfort them and we urge them towards living lives worthy of God's calling, he says you'll probably start to lose those in your church that really aren't interested in that. But if you don't do those things, then you're going to lose the baby. You're going to lose the new believers. And so we have to ask ourselves as a church, who would we rather lose? And that's a tough question uh, to talk about. Now the second month, uh, Adeline is, is different. There's lots of changes going on. She has learned uh, to look around, and she has wide eyes. Uh, she is beginning to recognize voices and faces. She smiles, and she drools a lot. She, is, she has just started to drool uncontrollably. She, you heard her choking on her own spit while she's sleeping in the, in the worship time. She is more content to lay down and just be by herself. Uh, she's discovering that she has hands and feet, and she's learning how to use them. She eats more, she burps more, she poops more. Uh, she's even trying to start to copy us if we stick our tongue out or if we smile or, or make faces at her. This is what parenting, reproducing ourselves, is all about. And none of us who are mature are excused from this process. If you're a mature follower of Christ here, you have a responsibility to be involved in this process of reproducing ourselves. If you don't, people will be neglected and the growth will be stunted. It takes all of us working together to see everyone grow into maturity in Christ. And so if this is all new to you, and maybe you would, you would maybe label yourself in that, in that new believer or that, that spiritual infant uh, category, uh, I want to say babies are great. Babies are great. But you don't want to stay a baby forever, do you? There is some growing up that you have to do. We know that there are spiritual markers. We know that there's, more, we know that there's markers in our own kids' lives. That, uh, that we will look for, and I think that it's reasonable that there are spiritual markers as well. And so I just want to talk for a second about some of those, uh, those markers. But here's, here's maybe what spiritual infancy might look like. Uh, whether you are a new believer or not, you might admit that you could land in this category. Maybe you have recently made a decision to follow Jesus, and you're just beginning the journey. This is you. Maybe you have recently, or maybe for a while now, you have called yourself a Christian, but you feel like past that point of decision, there really hasn't been a whole lot of growth. That might be you as well. Maybe for, uh, maybe, maybe for you, you're more concerned with yourself and your preferences than you are with service to others. Are you more concerned with arguing about issues in the church than you are acting to make things better? Are you following Christ so that your life is better? or for his glory and his kingdom? Are you allowing past hurts and habits and disappointments and unforgiveness to hold you back in your walk with God and your relationship with his church? Are you more worried about what people think of you and what people say about you because you're really not sure about what God thinks and says about you? These are some examples of spiritual immaturity. And the truth is that there are Christians who have been around for years and years and don't really understand what it is to sacrifice and to serve and to be generous and to give and to study and pray and the, the basics of, of what it is to be a Christ follower. Adeline is quite immature. She's two months old. We don't expect a whole lot from her at this point, but we will. There are some of the markers that we would like, look for with her as she grows and matures. I don't know how old you are spiritually, but if you find yourself as an infant in our church family, then maybe these are good markers for you to look for as well. So marker number one, I want to talk about these real quick. Uh, There's an expectation to grow and to mature. I have an idea of milestones that I would look for in Adeline. I, 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 I roughly know around what time she should start to crawl, maybe when she'll start to walk or, or when she'll say that first word, daddy, of course, right? When she'll look to go uh, and do potty training, school, uh, you know, dating around 30, right? Like these are, all n- these are all normal, natural things. 
Uh, we'll look for markers physically, spiritually, emotionally uh, to, to show that she is uh, growing uh, properly. This is a reasonable expectation. And so if you're a spiritual infant, then these are markers as well. And these are reasonable expectations that the, that the church would have for you as well, that you would grow and mature. What are the spiritual milestones to look for? We'll start with crawling and work up from there. Start with the fruit of the Spirit. Pastor Dave mentioned this. Uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That would be a good place to start. The second thing that we would look for in Adeline is that she's eating properly. And she has absolutely no problem eating. She amazes us with how fast she can down a bottle. Uh, but eventually she's going to move on to solid food. And she's going to work her way up into, into a more, uh, more solid food with that. If you're an infant in God's family and you don't understand the basics, learn them. First Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 3 says, Work to rid yourself of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Crave pure spiritual milk so you can grow up in your salvation. So we need to, to begin by, by taking the milk of the faith and then work our way up into uh, the more solid food. And if you're not getting fed at a level that you can understand, make some noise. Uh, Adeline, if we don't heat the bottle properly or we, we give her, if we were to give her something that she didn't want or she didn't like, that she wasn't ready to take in, then she would definitely make some noise. And I say that that's, that's, that's fair for the church as well. You need to be learning in a way that, that you can take in. And so uh, there's lots of ways that we offer to do that. Sunday school is a great example of that uh, for our kids, how they're receiving age-appropriate uh, teaching. Uh, we have life groups uh, that are studying some of the basics. We have, uh, we have special classes that we're, gonna, that we're running. We're looking at running Alpha in the fall. Uh, Alpha has been known around the world as a great course to teach the basics of the faith. And so maybe that's something that you're interested in. If you'd like to be a part of that, let the office know whether, uh, and we'll let you know details as they become available. Uh, I know that our women's ministry is starting a six-week study in April around Genesis and the, and the basics. Um, what about uh, our men's uh, ministry? We've got a men's workshop coming up uh, this next Saturday. A bunch of our men and, and men from around the area are going to be gathering in Owen Sound at the Pentecostal Church, uh, studying around this or hearing and learning around this topic of God's vision for men. Pretty basic stuff, but it's important for us to know. And so, but even as a newborn, Adeline's responsibility is to swallow as we give her the food. And so uh, wherever you're at in the process, you need to actually eat yourself. We can't make you do it. And if you don't eat, you don't grow. You have to get to the place where you aren't just being bottle fed. Learn to use the tools yourself and eat and grow. The third expectation we have for Adeline is that, she will dis that she'll continue to discover who she is. She'll, she'll learn about her hands and how to use them, and, and she'll learn about her personality and her natural giftings and abilities. This is a reasonable expectation. She'll get to a point where she's wide-eyed and curious and, and just wants to ask the question, why, 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 with everything. As an infant in God's family, experiment with who you are, what you have to offer, who God has created you uniquely to be. These are important things, where your spot in the family is. Be inquisitive, look around. Observe those who are mature in the faith and how the body of Christ functions. Be curious and start asking why. Be eager to learn and to take instruction and correction. Take the position of a learner and discover the family of God. Our fourth expectation is that, uh, you know, even as a two-month-old, uh, Adeline isn't able to contribute a whole lot of different things, but she absolutely contributes to our lives in a huge way. She isn't doing the dishes yet, but she does bring joy and happiness and laughter uh, into our home. So even if you're an infant in God's family, you have a place in the body of Christ. God has created you uniquely with certain gifts and abilities that you need to share. That's your responsibility. They're not for you. They're for the body of Christ. At Diamonds on Thursday, the guest speaker did a wonderful job of, of explaining the different stages of life and the the things that we are most able to contribute. Uh, he, he summed it up this way. He said, in our youth, we have energy and time, but no money. In our middle age, we have energy, 
and money, but no time. That's, I think that's the stage that I'm in. You know, as seniors, we have time and money, but no energy. If you saw the annual report, you'll see we've got a great, well-balanced church in all three of these stages of life. So as we, as we pour out what we have available to us, uh, we're going to balance each other out in these things, and we're going to be able to grow. There's always a temptation to settle, to not grow, to not take the time to eat, to not discover uh, our place in the family, to not contribute, just to sit back, enjoy the ride, not step into responsibility and maturity. But this is what the enemy uh, would like for you. The more Christians he can keep in spiritual infancy, the less effective the church will be. So how do you move forward? You have to take action to get up and move. And here's a quote that I know Pastor Dave has used before from our, he's not really a theologian, I guess, but uh, Winnie the Pooh. I always get to where I'm going by leaving or by walking away from where I've been. And so as a church family, if we're going to move into the future and, and focus on reproducing and, and, and growing our family through reaching people for Christ, then we have to, we have to make that action step and, uh, and, and move through these, these steps to do this as a church. This is exciting stuff. This, is, this, this, this type of thing changes a church. This brings new life. Nothing will bring excitement and unity and joy and exuberance to our church family more than new believers. This breathes life into our church more than anything else. This is God's heart. I hope it's yours as well. When was the last time you experienced this type of joy? Let's work at this together. God, thank you for uh, your family. God, we are family. And uh, God, over this series, God, we've seen uh, the different ways that our family grows and how it changes. God, help us to always be open to, to new people, whether that's uh, people that you're sending our way that are already uh, a part of the family of God but are looking for, for, for feeding and for, for community and, and for love. God, whether that's uh, speaking to our neighbors, God, and sharing the good news of the gospel and, and watching them grow uh, into this new life in Christ. Uh, God, help us to be great at both of these things. But God, we know that, that again, that's your heart. God, that you, your word says that you desire that, that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And so help us to be a people uh, of God that are, uh, that are active in that in, and quick to share. Uh, God, um, embracing those that you send our way. God, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.